Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third episode of CelebWorks Live series, Yojo Raps, an inside look into the iconic series of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. I'm Chris Arsaga. I'm Neri Lemus. Thanks for joining us on our inside look where knowing will no longer be half the battle. Before we bring on our special guest, we want to remind you that you can be automatically entered to win an autograph 8x10 from today's special guest. All you have to do is share this live stream and we will contact the winner after the show ends. I'm excited to bring on this voiceover legend. Neil Ross broke into voiceovers in the early 1980s in Los Angeles. Many don't realize how impactful his voiceover career was in many of their childhoods. Neil voiced numerous characters in many classic animated television shows. In G.I. Joe, Neil was Shipwreck, Buzzer, Monkey Wrench, Dusty and Thunder. In Transformers, he was Springer, Hook, Slag, and Bone Crusher. In Voltron, Defender of the Universe, he was Keith and Pidge. In Spider-Man, he was Norman Osborn and the Green Goblin. In Fantastic Four, he was Doctor Doom and the Puppet Master. He also played the title character in the animated Rambo, provided the voice of the character Honest John in the Steven Spielberg-produced animated feature in American Tale. He's also voiced numerous video games, including Metal Gear Solid, Command and Conquer, Call of Duty, and Doom 3. He was also the Codex narrator in Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3. His voice work has also been featured in many live action motion picture films, including Back to the Future 2, as the voice of the Biff Tannen Museum, being John Malkovich as the Malkovich documentary announcer. He has been heard and briefly seen in Dick Tracy as the Green Newsman, and some of other uh, some of Neil's other career highlights include narrating 22 episodes of the PBS science series Nova. He also was the announcer for the Academy Awards in 2003 and the Primetime Emmy Awards in 2004. And for five years, he was the announcer of the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award telecast. He is someone that Chris and I, with along with his wife, miss terribly as our dinner vacation companions. Please welcome our friend and client, the legendary Neil Ross, to the program. Yay, Neil. Uh-oh. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> After uh, listening to all of that stuff, I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have, you've had quite a career, Neil, and it's only fair to discuss it. <laughs> it's oh, true. You know, I'm, I really am so grateful. I was... I, I was so fortunate to be where I was when I was, and uh, I couldn't have wished for a better career. Honestly, I'm, I've been so blessed. It, it's iconic. It's iconic. Well, Neil, thanks for joining us, and uh, thanks for coming to answer some of our questions. Also, to the general public, if you have any G.I. Joe questions or really any questions in general for Neil or us, uh, please post them on the official stream, and we will answer them if we can. So I'm going to start it off. How the hell are you doing? How are you handling the quarantine? <laughs> well, the truth be told, I'm kind of an introvert and I was an only child. And so I sort of know how to be alone. It doesn't, uh, you know, even if, if, if Governor Newsom said, oh, what the hell, go out. I don't know that I would, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's I get it completely. I mean, I'm I'm craving, you know, social interaction. So, you know, it gets to a point where you're texting people and like checking in on them, and then I, I think I'm annoying everybody. But, uh, you know, well, it occasionally strike me how long it's likely to be before things get back to anything right. normal, whatever that was. And uh, it gives one pause, but I, I, I'm sort of weathering the storm better than most people, I think, because uh, I just sort of know how to be alone, you know. And I'm not really alone. Of course, I have my lovely wife here, who, uh, by the way, made the supreme sacrifice. No scrabble this afternoon, because I'm doing this. Oh, with oh. well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> tell, tell Jean, thank you, please. She gets, she gets an extra hug from us next time we come over. Yeah. No, we really appreciate it. The fans appreciate it. Um, That's right. She misses an, uh, one more opportunity to uh, beat me like a redheaded stepchild. <laughs> <laughs> I love she it. Travel with someone else, and they did it for seven years, and she knows all these stupid three-letter words with X's and Q's in them, and I, you know. <laughs> It's funny because Chris actually plays words on with friends online. So that's that version, Facebook version of Scrabble. 
Yeah. Uh, I feel, I, I don't feel it's as tough though, because, you know, people basically throw tile letters and hoping that the computer automated program will mm. hit a word. It, it's know? actually true. I do, I do that a lot. It's funny. I actually play with Mary Mack. Mary, Mary Mack is one of the people I play with. And then also uh, Stacy Gray, Michael Gray's wife. Uh, plays also so i you know whenever i'm bored i pick it up and i'm like oh yeah maybe i can and it is it's true you just throw some tiles in there and every once in a while you're like what is what's this word mean it means nothing well, it's like at least Irish. at least you're learning <laughs> at least you're learning new words so i guess that's a yeah, thing so i'm it's true. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna launch us into the discussion for many fans out there who really want to know the full scope of your career you recently wrote and published a book called vocal recall Chris and I have it. Uh, it's a great book. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, perfect. Wait, right here. We need the shot. There we go. Yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. It's available on it always keep, right here. I, have a little I, keep, I keep it right by my bedpost so I can think of Neil when I'm sleeping. It's now available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. And for more information, we can go. You can, you can go. You can go to neilbook.com. That's neilbook.com. Impressed. You're a good <laughs> eye pillow guy. Yeah, oh I am not the night my pillow guy. That guy's a Republican. So to help oh us God, to man. help us to to help us dive into your past, we've recently lost little Richard. Ooh, you discuss yes. in the book during your formative years that rock and roll music kind of led you to listening to music on the radio, which in turn led you to your first big passion in professional life. Can we discuss a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, the late uh, Lenny Kilmister of Motorhead. Lemmy. Uh, yeah, Lemmy. He discussed talking with a young rock and roll uh, musician, and he said, the difference between you and me is I remember when there was no rock and roll, and it was effing <laughs> horrible. <laughs> <laughs> And it really was effing horrible. Some of the stuff they in the early 50s, I just, I didn't enjoy music. I had my little radio, and as soon as I heard music, I would change the station looking for somebody talking because music just bored me. Once in a while, I might go to a band concert, and if they played something up-tempo, I'd picture a chase scene in a Western, and okay, I can kind of live with this. Anyway, I'm, home, I'm at a friend's house. I'm about 10, 11 years old, and his older sister comes in, turns the radio on, and it's a music show. And all of a sudden, this song came on, and it was like nothing I had ever heard before. Because it was like nothing I had ever heard before. It probably was the first rock and roll record. And that was Tutti Frutti, right? That was Tutti Frutti by Little Wow. Little and uh, I've since read, uh, since he's passed away, I read a number of biographies, and it's interesting. He, they were trying to record him, and the producer was not getting what he wanted. And they took a break, and they went into a nightclub and had a couple of drinks, and Richard got up on stage and started doing what he really wanted to do. And the producer said, that's what I want, that. Get back in the studio. Let's record this. Uh, and it, it was the, really the beginning of rock and roll. And if you listen carefully to the early Beatles stuff, you can tell they had many, many, many influences, but they were hugely influenced by Richard. You can hear them doing those things that he used to do, those high pitched squeals. Uh, he, he was, uh, well, hearing that record caused me to start looking for more music like that, which quickly came along, Elvis Presley, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, suddenly I'm listening to music now for the first time in my life. And I listened to what was then Top 40 AM radio. And, you know, at a certain point, the music kind of died, as the song says. Uh, Elvis went into the army. Uh, Buddy Holly was killed in a plane crash. The music sort of wasn't so great anymore. Usually there'd be like four or five songs in the top 40 that I really wanted to hear. The rest of them I wasn't interested in. And I found myself over time beginning to listen to the DJs, the things they said, the things they did, the way they wove in and out of records and did weather forecasts and read commercials and got their personality across. And I started to become a fan of one guy in particular, and that was a guy named Bill Balance, who was working at KFWB, which was the top station in Los Angeles then. 
And one mad night listening to him, I thought, I wonder if I could do that. Because I didn't seem to have any musical talent, but maybe I could be a part of this whole thing by being one of the DJs. And that started me off on a quest to get into the radio business. And that really kicked off the trajectory of my life. I spent the next 20 years in radio, gradually discovering about the voiceover business. And I was able to make the transition from radio into voiceovers in the early 80s. But you could make a case that I, if I had not heard that little Richard song, uh, my life might have taken a totally different direction. You just don't know. Absolutely. And later on, no, I was going to say la later, later on, we can sort of dive into it because I think you have another story later with little Richard on how okay. in impactful that was in your life. So yeah. we'll go to that. And I think Chris has the follow up. Yeah, actually, that leads right into my question. Uh, you moved from Montreal to Los Angeles at 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it must have been pretty scary having your whole life shifted at that point. Uh, you were working a paper route when you asked your friend to introduce you to your mentor, Otto Miller. Can we talk about the start of your radio career from that point forward? Sure. Well, it was really tough to find out anything about the radio business. It's nowadays the fourth wall has been torn down, and uh, you can find it out. Of, you can you can watch disc jockeys working on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You no, know, there's no, but in those days, oh, it was all very mysterious. And if you went to a radio station, the receptionist would say, well, we don't have time for this nonsense and show you the door. And uh, I just a friend of mine who had the paper out next to mine um, happened to mention that one of his customers was a radio guy. And I asked if he would introduce me. And it turned out to be a fellow named Otto Miller. Not the guy I would have chosen necessarily. He worked for the beautiful music station, uh, Montavani, 101 Strings, and this kind of thing. And he did newscasts, and then he had a classical music show at night. So he wasn't a swinging top 40 DJ, which is what I wanted to meet. But actually, he was perfect for me because... And I try to picture this scene if this happened to me today, you know, knock, knock, knock on the door. You open the door and there's, there's your paper boy with his dumb friend standing next to him. And ah, friend, <laughs> business. Can, can you help him? I don't know. <laughs> I do, but this guy was, he took me in and he was very fatherly and he gave me some wonderful advice. Uh, he was a he was a radio guy, solid radio guy, one of those beautiful, deep, resonant baritone voices. And um, he he told me what to do, and I I pretty much did what he told me to do, and it all worked out. And I'm very grateful to him. He passed away many many years ago, and he never, I don't think, had a clue whatever happened to me, which is sad. I would have. Love to have been able to call him up and say, look at all this stuff I did. And it's all because of you, you know, or at least you had a big part in getting me launched, but was not to be. Well, you know, uh, I, I think that that part of that story is so fundamental for people that want to get into the business. And sometimes I think a lot of the fans that are saying, you know, we want to, I want a voiceover career. What do I do to start? Sometimes all it takes is just reaching out to someone you admire or somebody that you know and someone that's more successful and sort of get a pinpoint, uh, a jump start from there. Um, radio got you into the, the Navy. Uh, was that something that you were hesitant on? Um, uh, oh. And the, the reason I ask that is because many of the people that, you know, joined the Navy, I, they weren't even guaranteed a, a civilian role. So can you talk a little bit about that history? Well, actually, radio didn't get me into the Navy. The draft board got me into well, it. Right, right. No, I, right. No, I know. Uh, <laughs> I, during the uh, Vietnam unpleasantness, I think we're calling it now. Right. Uh, right. Uh, I was this close to being drafted, and I found out about a program the Navy had at the time through the Naval Reserve where you could do two years active, a year of meetings, and, and you were done. So I opted for that. And then I had a tremendous stroke of luck. It's a long story. And I don't know that you, if you want to go into the nuts and bolts of it, but I met a guy who was a chief petty officer and he was in, at the uh, sink pack fleet commander in chief, United States Pacific fleet, Pearl Harbor, uh, public affairs office. 
And he said, my God, you're coming into the service. You're perfect. I, I need a guy like you. You're absolutely perfect. And I'm going to talk to my captain and we're going to get in touch with the Pentagon. And uh, once, once you go on active duty, you'll come to work for me. And that's exactly what happened. So I'm one of those rare birds who uh, enlisted, served, and was discharged in the same city. I never left Honolulu. And I didn't have to go on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Lad, as they say. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I, did, I did end up at sea for a couple of weeks, but uh, that was semi-bearable. I don't think I could have stood two years of that, I'll tell you. That that kind of leads me into like probably what most people want to hear about that are tuning in, because obviously this is supposed to be G.I. Joe, but uh, you know, you were in the Navy and you voiced shipwreck. Yeah. Ooh. Navy. Uh, how did you transition from doing radio to into voiceover? Well, ever since a very young age, I had always sort of fooled around with doing character voices and accents. It, it just seemed to be almost a compulsion. Some kids build model airplanes. I sat in my room and it tried to sound like a duck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> Worked out, you know. If I, you, know, you don't see a room full of balsa planes in back of me, I uh, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so I, I, I began to, at a certain point, become disenchanted with radio, and I began to wonder about the people who I heard voicing national television commercials, national radio commercials, uh, promo announcers, uh, people, and people who did animation. I thought, where are they? Who are these people? It was like a Seinfeld routine. Who are these people? <laughs> In those days, nobody knew about voiceover. Again, the fourth wall hadn't come down. It was a very well kept secret. And I found out about it and I thought, wow, there is a job that is absolutely perfect for my dopey little collection of talents. I, I can't think of anything better. Really, if I had to invent a job, it wouldn't be any better than, than voiceovers. I must get into this business. And so I wangled a job in Los Angeles on the radio and immediately started trying to get into the voiceover game. I did workshops and all the usual stuff that you do, and it took me about five years. But at the end of five years, I was actually making more money outside the building than inside the building. And... <laughs> Eventually, the tail was wagging the dog, and I walked into uh, KMPC in Hollywood, a station I had dreamed of working for, and I finally did for three years, and said, uh, I'm done. It's, it's been fun. It's been great, right. And then, uh, you know, have, I have bigger fish to fry. <laughs> absolutely. And many of them are iconic characters. And, you know, like we said, Shipwreck, it's, it's beloved by many G.I. Joe fans. What was your inspiration for the character? I said, what was your inspiration for the character of Shipwreck? Oh, yeah. The shipwreck is really kind of interesting. You mentioned the Navy. <clears throat> and he's also from San Diego, where I spent all That's told right. seven years. Uh, I went to high school there. And so there's some interesting parallels, but basically what happened was I went in to do the audition and they had a picture of shipwreck and a little one or two paragraph description. And Wally Burr was running the audition and I went in and I started to do a few different approaches and I could tell nobody was terribly thrilled with what I was doing. And there was a guy sitting over in the corner <clears throat> and he looked at me and he said, uh, have you ever seen the last detail and fortunately, I had. Uh, it's sort of been forgotten, but it was a, an early Jack Nicholson movie, and he was nominated for Best Actor. He didn't win that year, but still not bad. But then uh, within the next couple of years, along came uh, Chinatown and uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and everybody sort of forgot about the last detail. It was a, it's a nice little uh, picture directed by Hal Ashby. It's about a couple of sailors who are assigned the job of taking a third sailor to spend the next eight years in the brig at Portsmouth. It's their job to take him there. And so they're issued 45s and uh, 
it, it, it's, it's their detail, detail meaning assignment. And they decide to show this kid some fun before he has to go to prison. And there's all kinds of crazy misadventures. And there's a particular scene in a bar where the racist bartender doesn't want to serve them because one of the guys is black. And they start to argue. And at a certain point, the bartender says, you guys get out of here or I'll call the shore patrol. And Jack hauls this 45 caliber semi-auto out of its holster, slams it on the bar and says, you want the shore patrol? We are the mother bleeping shore patrol. And that's what I was thinking as I read those lines. And I said, that's what they want. I see what they want. And <clears throat> I had done this voice that people said sort of reminded them of Jack Nicholson. So that's the one I went with, the kind of high-pitched uh, up in here which is sort of the way he sounded uh, when he was younger. You know, now he's uh, somewhere down in here. But back then, <laughs> you know, in, in that sort of range. And that's what I did. And when I finished, the fellow in the corner says, you got it. That's, yeah, pretty cool. that's a great story, considering uh, we, were, we spoke to Greg Berger a couple weeks ago. He was one of our first guests. And he said that he had walked into the room when they were, you know, basically picking out characters and there was numerous slides uh, laid mm -hmm. out on a table. And he was the one that was able to pick the characters that he wanted. And he picked uh, Spirit and Firefly. So mm -hmm. this that didn't go for you. I mean, they, you had to audition for Shipwreck. That's my memory, yes. That, 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 was, the only, that was the only character on the table when I came in. But yeah, sometimes uh, in the beginning, they would put maybe 10 characters out there and say, look, uh, you know, take your best shot. If you want to try three or four of these, go ahead. But my memory of that one is all they were interested in was casting Shipwreck. Did you do you remember if you were auditioned for Shipwreck first or for Buzzer first? No, I actually was doing Buzzer. OK, yeah, because I remember yeah. reading in, in your book that you said that Buzzer was the f one that you had voiced first. That was that was the first G.I. Joe character that I got was Buzzer. And then uh, <clears throat> I think uh, Shipwreck was next. And then the rest of them came along as, as, as time passed. Did did uh, I noticed on IMDb, which obviously we don't always go by IMDb. They're wrong sometimes for everybody out there. Don't go by IMDb always. Um, did you do you? Did you get to do Polly's voice ever, or was it just because I know Frank did it for the most part? Did you ever get yeah, to do it? Um, nobody really was assigned that character. I did it sometimes. Frank did it. I, I think uh, Wally some sometimes would forget, and he would. I would be there, but he would ask Frank to do the the Polly line, which uh, fine, you know. Right. So. so we, we you were the one that was supposed to do it, or did it? Well, again, it, it really it was wasn't an assigned ever. character. And, uh, oh, okay. So <laughs> Wally would just kind of point at either me or Frank and go, give me, give me some Polly, uh, Wally, or whatever it is. And, uh, <laughs> Mark, all right, Wally. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, speaking of Wally Burr, I mean, iconic voice director. He's known for so yeah. many of the iconic 80s series that many people and many of our fans love. Can you walk us through one of the Wally Burr ses sessions? I mean, you guys had an all-star cast. Yeah, well, Wally was, uh, he was a driven man. He really, he had a sound the, in his head and he wouldn't rest until he'd got that sound on tape. And he was probably the best prepared director I ever worked for. He would frequently arrive bleary-eyed because he'd been up till four in the morning uh, reading these scripts and making notes. And uh, some people got angry with him. They felt the sessions went on way too long. The rehearsals were too ponderous. Um, geez, I don't know. All I know is that there's a, a big reason why you guys are able to book me in conventions. And the reason m mainly is G.I. Joe and Transformers. Absolutely. And shows were voice directed by Wally Burr. If I had not been in those shows, I doubt that I would be much of a draw at these conventions at all. Maybe a little bit for Voltron, but it wouldn't be anywhere near uh, the draw that it is. And, and those are 
two of a handful of shows that are still remembered and revered by the fans. And if, if Wally were here, he would be more than entitled to say, maybe there's a reason for that kid. <laughs> and part of the reason is all that work we did and all the hours that we put in, it paid off and he might be right. And I, I think, I think he is right. I mean, I know that the, you told uh, a story once about what Brian Cummings said in a session. I'm not sure he even remembers it, but basically it was the best line in terms of the, the voiceover sessions taking too long. Well, we all used to, well, most of us would do lines from time to time. Michael Bell was particularly good. If an actor got released early, he would shout across the room, get word to my wife, tell her to remarry. <laughs> I'm never getting out of here. <laughs> Could you go to my daughter's high school graduation? <laughs> oh, God. But we were doing. I never remember that one for Michael when he's on. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we're doing the G.I. Joe movie, and it was moving at a glacial pace. And most of us had to park in the street on Hollywood way and they had parking meters and <laughs> you would, uh, you'd say I, in two hours, I got to get out and put more money in the meter. And then you'd get in the recording session and you'd forget and you'd get a ticket. So <laughs> this session just went on and on and on. And finally there's a lull and it's dead quiet. And everybody's just looking at their shoes and Brian Cummings says, you know, when I first came in here, I was worried about parking. Now I'm starting to sweat depreciation. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> I I guess this session has gone on too long. Line that anybody came up with, with all these <laughs> absolutely <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal. <laughs> I, I, my favorite story is actually in the book, and I've heard you tell this one in in uh, panels and stuff. But mm -hmm. there, I'm sure there's a bunch of people that haven't heard this one. But my favorite story is the one where you talk about Frank, and it's the overlap story with Wally. Yeah, yeah. can you tell that one to everybody? Yeah, it's. Uh, I have to do a little bit of inside baseball, but in most uh, animation shows, they do not want two actors to overlap. In other words, they don't want the actor who's doing the second line to jump on the last syllable of the first actor's line because they may need to separate them for picture considerations. Uh, so no matter how heated the scene is, you have to remember to leave just a little nanosecond between lines so the editor can get in there with, in those days, the razor blade. I swear to God, they cut tape with gem razor blades in those days. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous now with the digital, but anyway. So, uh, and people have often asked me, what if you have to do two of your characters talking to each other? How do you deal with that? And there, I can go into that if you want, but anyway... Wally forgot that Frank was doing a scene with himself. It was two of Frank's characters and they were having a heated argument. And Wally never looked at us. He always had his head down at looking at the storyboard, almost never looked through the window. So Frank launches into this scene. He's having a fight with himself. And I mean, he is flying, bam, 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 bam. And all of a sudden Wally pops on the button and he says, oh, nope, sorry, we gotta go back. We had an overlap. <laughs> Looking at each other like, did he? He didn't just say that, you know. We're going, Wally. It's all Frank. How the hell could he have an overlap? What? Huh? Oh, geez. Oh God. I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> no overlap. I mean, that's how fast Frank was going back and forth between these two characters, and and wow. Frank being Frank, he just smiled, said, "I'll do it again." <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. Yeah, Frank, I mean, Frank is an amazing. Uh, amazing talent it's just it's just all inspiring i'll tell you well i mean for gi joe and transformers like i said it's an all-star cast there's some iconic characters uh and when i mean characters i mean iconic voiceover professionals that basically took part in these series i mean you michael bell uh you know people like scatman crothers mm -hmm. did episodes of uh transformers um, I know that there's a famous Scatman Crothers story that you have of uh, <laughs> of when he uh, sort of took a uh, sabbatical. Can you right. tell us a little bit about that? Well, we all loved uh, Scatman. He was just uh, just a sweet, sweet man. If you 
if you've seen uh, The Shining, that character that he plays in there is is not too dissimilar from the real scat man. He was a very warm, uh, lovely guy. And he'd been having some health problems and we were concerned about him. He's an older fella. And uh, so he, uh, it was a small cast that day, maybe five or six of us sitting around the table. Wally hadn't come in yet. And somebody said, hey, has anybody seen Scat Man? How's he doing? And well, no, not really. I haven't seen him. Have you seen him? No, no, no. Well, let's ask Wally when he comes in. We'll, we'll see. So Wally comes in and we say, hey, Wally, uh, uh, how's uh, Scat Man doing? He says, oh, he's fine. He's he's doing fine. I uh, talked to him just the other day. <laughs> he's a crazy. He's he's a nut. You know, he's out. Of, he's out of it. What, what, what are you what are you talking about? He said, do you know, he called me the other day to tell me he's black. <laughs> Yes, yes, I'm sitting at my desk and my secretary says, Scatman's on the phone. I pick the phone up and I say, uh, Hi, Scat <laughs> Hello, Wally. I'm just calling to tell you I'm black. And I said, What? <laughs> oh, everybody knows you're black. Now stop bothering me. I'm busy. And I hug up on him. Hey, crazy guy. Yeah, you know, he's been out of town for a few months working on a movie and that. Uh, <gasps> he wasn't calling to tell me he was black. He was calling to tell me he was back. <laughs> he runs into his office and slams the door uh. <laughs> and we fell on the floor <laughs> we picture scat man at the other end of that phone call hey well i'm just here to tell you i'm, bl I'm back Yeah. Is there is there anybody else from, you know, either series that you enjoyed working with that, you know, was kind of a shock when you walked into the recording session? Well, I um I I always forget his name and and I get bogged down. Why do I oh, Ro Roger C Carmel. I that's I'm glad that we brought him up exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, people may not be familiar with him. He did a couple of episodes of the original Star Trek. He played a character named Harry Mudd. Hmm. And, uh, you know, he was a huge uh, guy, way over six feet and uh, just large all over. And he sweated like no other human being I've ever been around. He used to bring a bath towel to sessions and he was mopping his, <laughs> you know, and telling these theater stories that were were just wonderful i mean he he uh he was uh he was like a force of nature and it was uh, it was a real treat to meet him you know you never know how similar people are that you see on television or in movies to the characters that they play but if anything he was even more flamboyant in real life than the harry mudd character he, he was uh i he, I think there's an iconic story that you have where you were attending the the film premiere for Transformers the movie on Hollywood Boulevard and you're sitting in the theater watching the movie and you can take it from there. Yeah, actually we were, it was at, in Westwood, I, I think. Oh, was it Westwood at the Bruin? Okay, got it. Uh, theater that, that they used in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> the movie ends and the lights come up and people get up and start, and, and three or four of the executives from the company that made the movie, they're in a little cluster in, in, the, in the aisle. And suddenly from in back of me, I hear, bravissimo, genius, a towering achievement. And it's Roger C. Carmel, and he's running toward these guys yelling. And they're looking at him like, who is this lunatic? <laughs> you know? And he... He embraces them and tells them what a brilliant film this was and how it's going to be a smash and all of this thing. And I was okay. I, I decide to leave. And as I'm walking out of the theater, this hand descends on my shoulder, and it's Roger. He says, "I uh, don't seem to have any transportation, my boy. <laughs> any chance you could uh, give me a ride back to Hollywood if it's not on the way?" Well, it was in exactly the opposite direction from where I was going, but I thought, oh, what the hell? And, and in those days, I'm driving this stupid little Renault Alliance. Oh, God, so, yeah, <laughs> I cram Roger into the passenger seat. You know, his knees are up around his chin. And, and we're driving toward Hollywood. And uh, he says, 
I uh, I hope, uh, do you think those fellas realized I only came in in the last two minutes in that pile of... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, no, I said, I, I wouldn't worry about it. The sound <laughs> was so loud, you could have come in in a tank and they wouldn't have known. <laughs> he said, I, I said, so you, you were not able to uh, hear your voice? <laughs> he said, my boy, the only voice I wanted to hear was that little voice that says, let's go out to the lobby. Let's go out to the lobby. <laughs> he, he sang that whole stupid song. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> laughing. Uh, was going all over the road. Thank God it was late at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know. my God. <laughs> So he, he was in, a character. Uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> in in you said in your book, and it was February of uh, I think it was Valentine's Day actually of 1984 was when you guys did your first session, right? Do you yeah. remember anything about that day at all, or you know? And I've talked to other actors in the show, especially people who did both shows. There are a few people who only did one, but uh, there were a, there was a huge overlap in casts and. Over the years, it's it's all sort of melted into one big session. <laughs> and we're doing that day. <laughs> guy Joe, and it's you know, uh, well, I just you know, it, I have a vague memory of trying, especially when I got on Transformers, uh, not having a clue what was going on because <laughs> nobody explained anything. You know, as I understand it. Uh, if if you go to work on a sitcom, uh, they make what's called the Bible available to you. It is essentially a whole little book on the show, uh, descriptions of each character, motivations, where the plot line has gone. So you read that and you, you can sort of fit into the show. But you you would just show up and Wally would start recording and it was like, well, okay. Uh, you, you know, especially in the case of Transformers, I I basically did that whole show not really understanding. You, you're, scream, you're screaming words like, Unicron, go! And then all of a sudden you're like, I have no clue what Unicron is. <laughs> what the hell is Megatron? I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Why does Optimus Prime keep wanting to meet Megatron? I don't know. <laughs> I, that's what I tell most fans. You know, you folks know far more about this show than I ever did. Uh, I, <laughs> I know that's disillusioning, but I, I think that's the case with most, you know, absolutely business. Though they're like, you know, fans will reference a certain episode, and you're like, I don't remember that. I don't know. <laughs> well, they see it over and over again, and uh, you know, we don't. Uh, we may never have seen the episode. Most because yeah. most of those shows aired in the afternoon, and we were out working. Right. And uh, I, I don't know when I got a VCR, but, you know, <laughs> I, I always used to try to tape a couple episodes and watch them just to see if there was anything I needed to know about the picture. I usually wasn't. The That's fans, the fans are totally understand. They understand that, you know, you guys at the time, the impact or the success of these shows, it was not known it, that that came much later. Uh, one of the things that many of our GI Joe fans asked, constantly is any interaction with the great Chris Lotta. Um, do you have any stories that you can share with our audience, uh, you know, uh, pertaining you and Chris Lotta? My, we were never, uh, you know, uh, we didn't socialize or anything like that. We just, we just worked together. The, the thing that, that I would say about Chris, the memory that I'm getting is of the old Wally Burr studio on Ventura Boulevard before he moved to the two studios in Hollywood way. And I was, I was pretty, I was playing catch up uh, cause I didn't have that really that much formal training as an actor. And uh, so I was trying to learn anything I could. So I used to sneak into the, uh, the control room, there was a couch in the back and I would tiptoe in and sit on the couch and watch other guys work, trying to learn things. And I always made a point of being on that couch when Chris was working. If I wasn't in the room with him, I wanted to be on that couch and, and, and watch him work. And the guy held nothing back. He, he gave a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time. 
and he was a really good actor and that voice was amazing he could because Wally wanted a lot of takes sometimes each line he'd do 10 15 takes on each line and Chris would do these voices that if I did it for five minutes I'd have to be carried out on a stretcher and he would just go on and on and on we used to say what do you got in there barbed wire <laughs> <laughs> but he um I, I really admired his uh, his eth work ethic, as I said, 100%, 100% of the time. And he was supremely talented. And he was starting to get on camera work toward the end of his life. And Chris was one of these, I've been around other people that I've thought this of too. You kind of say, if this guy goes all the way and becomes a big star, I'm not going to be surprised. It's all there. He He... He could have uh, he could have had a wonderful on camera career because he's an interesting looking guy. I mean, he was never going to play the lead, but boy, I could see him playing villains and and all kinds of interesting interesting characters. Especially now, some of these shows they have on on Netflix, like Ozark. Oh, oh God, Chris could have that show. <laughs> well, here here's the the, the mind blowing Chris Lotta story. There was a movie. Uh, called uh oh god now i'm forgetting what it what it was called it may come back to me but it was about uh, a female detective who gets assigned a, a job in the jewelry section of new york uh, because some of these jewelers are being strong-armed and two guys come in to rob this jewelry store and she gets the drop on them and gets the handcuffs on them and they break away and they're running through the streets stuck together with handcuffs they commandeer a cab they're trying to get away, and finally the cab crashes, and one of them is killed, and the other one is led away. And that's the last you see of them. Well, the two thugs in that very brief scene, A Stranger Among Us is the name of the movie. There we the go. Two, the two characters are Chris Latta and um, the guy who, uh, uh, James Gandolfini, the guy who played. Oh, man. Soprano, a very young, thin James Gandolfini. And I thought, wow. You know, the, the, diff, the way those two careers diverged. And I could have seen Chris in The Sopranos in a heartbeat uh, in any one of a number of roles in that show. He could have torn it up. And he was also a, a great stand-up comedian. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, but. he he actually operated as a stand-up comedian under the uh, professional name Chris Collins. For anybody that wants to go to YouTube and check it out, Christopher Collins. So... He had just won some big uh, comedy uh, competition up in San Francisco. The last time I saw him, he told me that. And then, I don't know, what seemed like a very short time later, I pick up a copy of the Hollywood Reporter, and there's his obituary. I couldn't believe oh. it. 46, I believe. Wow. Way too young. So. I mean, unfortunately, his death, you know, would have been detrimental for many fans that would have wanted to meet him, also detrimental for, you know, the work that would have come out possibly for GI Joe mm -hmm. later on or transformers. I mean, he was star scream for God's sake. So, yeah, you know, yeah. many of these fans feel a connection to those characters. Um, are, is there any other recording booth stories that you can share that you would want to leave our audience uh, with recording booth stories? Uh, I'm sure there's something there, but nothing's popping into my mind. Um, I may think of something as we yeah no as we go yeah sure when uh when you guys were doing the show you got word that uh that you were going to be in the movie you know the transformers mm -hmm. movie, gi joe movie and then when you when you did the transformers movie you found out that there were a bunch of other actors that were going to be in it what was that like finding out about like leonard nimoy and orson wells and well you know it was it was uh, uh interesting to think that we might get to <clears throat> work with these people but on the other hand as we delved uh, through the script we discovered most of our characters <laughs> died <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was sort of a downer <laughs> you know? absolutely i mean orson is all very well but uh what about my character and um yeah it's uh the movie I, I knew it was destined to fail because you just don't, I, what they wanted to do was 
sell a bunch of toys, frankly, and new toys, new yeah. characters. Well, you can add characters, but I think they forgot, you know, how much their fans loved the characters that they had already established, especially uh, Optimus Prime. Peter Cullen was is marvelous in that part, oh, and yeah, the fans loved him. And I, I always use the analogy. I say, you know, it's like if they did a Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movie and halfway through the movie, Tom Cruise's character dies and he gets replaced by somebody you never heard of. <laughs> Might be a slight problem there. Yeah. And, and uh, well, you know, we went ahead and did what we had to do. And, uh, you know, the... You know, people now have rediscovered the movie as they got older, and and uh, I I don't know how many uh, DVDs and VHSs and movie posters I've signed, but a lot of fans tell me that the death of Optimus Prime was probably the <laughs> the greatest trauma of their of their youth. <laughs> they never right. for it. Never got over it. It's funny because yeah. I think it's Ron Friedman, who is one of the original writers of the series. He wrote a book called I Was the Man That Killed Optimus Prime, which I was like, that that title, I, I don't know if that's going to incite well, violence or, <laughs> you know, or people are going to read the book. Who knows? But um, like I said earlier, you know, people are so connected to these shows, G.I. Joe and Transformers. People travel hundreds of miles to see you at shows across the country. And uh, I, I kind of want to know your perspective and why you think that the series was such a prevalent and long lasting success. Um, it, you know, I have pondered that at the time that we did it, the general wisdom was that any show would probably only last two or three years and then its audience would outgrow it. And the new crop of young kids coming up wouldn't want that because they'd want their own show. And so, uh, you know, uh, the idea of an animated show lasting more than three years or and being even vaguely remembered in 10 or 15 was just unheard of. Uh, I think the longest running show at that point would have been the Smurfs. They did seven years, as I recall. But the idea of uh, something like... Uh, the Simpsons, which is what now, 30 years? It's 30 years, yeah. yeah. Uh, people would have, you know, if you'd said there's going to be an animated show that runs 30 years, you're insane, you know. And 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 the general wisdom was uh, this stuff will all be quickly forgotten and um, no one will care anymore. And so to find oneself 30 plus years later, being besieged by fans at conventions who who still love and revere the shows especially transformers i i've i've pondered it i i don't know exactly what it is it's you know it, it's it's kind of like this the sum this the whole became greater than the sum of its parts they they assembled a group of uh writers, producers, artists, animators, actors, directors, etc., etc., that as a whole wound up creating something far more uh far more compelling than I think they actually set out to do in the in, in the beginning, which I think really all it was about uh, to be honest with you was selling toys. <clears throat> but if all this was was a 30-minute toy commercial, it would have been forgotten years ago. Right. There was something deeper in both of those shows that resonated with people. And exactly what that was is hard to define. I, I don't know. I think in the case of Transformers, people love to anthropomorphize. You know, when you're a little kid, it's talking animals. And then you get a little older and it's talking robots. Somehow the idea of a non-human entity having human thoughts, emotions, and feelings is very compelling to us. I don't know why. And that might be a clue to Transformers. G.I. Joe, I don't know. Well, with G.I. Joe, I mean, we're in 2020 right now. And Hasbro recently released on YouTube 
GI Joe in, in a miniseries in certain sections. They, they've, uh, you know, unveiled some of their former episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris and I talk about this all the time. Uh, the moral of the story, basically, of each of these episodes, a, a lot of the fans that come up to your table is, you know, I watched the show when I was a kid. It was the only thing I had for Saturday mornings. You know, my parents were fighting. I almost contemplated suicide. You know, your voice meant so much to me. I think essentially that's what it was. It was the, you know, uh, for many fans, a life-saving grace in part of their lives. And Chris, can you elaborate on that? I mean, well, I think, I mean, for me, I, I don't know if you know this, Neil, but I was actually just talking about Nuri about this a couple of days ago on, on Lankershim and Chandler. There used to be a, a, a Chevy dealership there. My dad worked there and I would get picked up from school and I'd be with him until it was time to go home. So I would stay in the lounge, like the, the lounge where people would wait for their cars and mm -hmm. I would go to work and I'd have GI Joe on in the background. Mm. And I think it's, I think it's the fact that people are familiar, you know, it's something that's familiar. And when you become really familiar with something, you look at it as almost like something that's a part of you or like a part of your family. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's why there's such a big influence on so many people, because back then we didn't have like the, you know, media like it is now where it keeps coming at us from all over the place. It was just a very closed caption where it was like, this is what you're watching and you're very mm -hmm. intent on mm -hmm. it. So yeah. I think that was like a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much more to choose from now. It was yeah. You got to remember in that time there was no uh, cable TV. I guess it was in its it on TV. I remember that it was a little box with like, like just a little <clears> yeah. switch. <laughs> you just put on. <laughs> yeah, cable was sort of in its infancy, and and basically you had uh, these these depending on the size of your city, you had three, four, five TV channels, or maybe only three or two, and whatever was on was on. And uh, suddenly there was this uh, avalanche of animated stuff in the afternoons because they had deregulated children's television to the point where it became economically feasible to do that. Yeah. But yeah, Neri is right. I mean, we used to joke about them, but the, the public service announcements in G.I. Joe, you know, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. I've had people come up and tell me the only moral education I had as a child were those things. I, I got nothing from my parents, yeah. nothing from anybody. That was the only thing I had. And people who joined the military because they wanted to be, uh, you know, like Duke. G.I. Yeah, Joe, yeah. Or, or you know, and, and these are people, you can tell without some kind of an inspiration to guide them, God knows where they'd have ended up. But as it is, uh, you know, you wanted to be like Duke, you went ahead, you had a successful 20 year military career, and now you're in law enforcement. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the PSAs, because I don't think I've ever asked any of you guys this question at all. But do you remember, like, because I know you have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not everybody had one. The Cobra guys obviously didn't have one, yeah. but the GI Joe guys had them. And do you remember, like, how did they approach you about that? Was it that it was like tacked on at the end where they were like, "Hey, stay around. You got to do your PSA," and everybody else? Yeah, was over? yeah something along those lines. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering because I was like, "Yeah, you know, you're all excited. You get to go home. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you got to help kids for a little bit now. Hold on." <laughs> Got to teach people morals. <laughs> no, there was no going home if you worked for Wally. <laughs> he used to say he should he should just put a dorm in here and we'll just all we'll just all live here. <laughs> he can sound reveille in the morning and we'll run up to the studio. I, well, I actually have a question for you that's got, I'm gonna switch gears just for a second and hope everybody doesn't kill me on this one. But I remembered this. When we when we were talking about having you on the show, and I remembered that you had voiced something, and I for, totally forgot to ask you about this. So in 1997, there was a Star Wars video game that came out where you played Han Solo and Boba Fett. It was like a fighting game. Do you remember mm -hmm. anything about that at all? Uh, playing Han Solo in a video game? no. Oh, okay. People asked me about that. Nobody ever said imitate Harrison Ford or anything. Oh, really? No. And yeah, because you're credited. I mean, not only that, there's another video game where you're credited as Han Solo also. Yeah. So I was just curious. I wanted to switch gears there for a minute. I, I was curious. Yeah, I must apologize about games. You know, I can talk talk fairly 
knowledgeably about Transformers and G.I. Joe because we did so many episodes that it it, it really it, there's a lot to draw from. But in, when you do these games, usually in most cases, it's like a four hour session and you're done. <laughs> And somebody plays the game for weeks or months on end and becomes obsessed with it. And then they want to know inside stuff. And I can't even remember doing it. It was <laughs> one four-hour period out of my life. That's awesome. And, <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, it's not that I'm being cavalier. It's, it's no, just, I know. <laughs> it just doesn't print. It was another yeah. day at the office. Unless... You know, something really bizarre happened at the session. I'm probably not going to remember a great deal about it, unfortunately. Right. So with games, I'm not very helpful, and I feel bad about it. I wish I had. Some. I don't. It's it's okay. I I knew it was kind of a long shot because yeah. that game. I don't even think many people even remember it. It was a Star Wars fighting game, so oh. I don't think many people even own that game. I was something, like, oh, you know. <laughs> I I I got something we can talk about it just for just touch base on it. a lot of the fans that we have here are Voltron fans and they recently saw you in a commercial where you BJ Ward and Michael Bell reprised your characters from Voltron right. what was it what was it like to step into the role after so many years well we were laughing um I wondered if I could get up there again you know that high what he where, where is he somewhere it's, in here I'd have to edge right yeah <laughs> Oh, the pitch thing. Oh, God help me. You know, that's not <laughs> funny at this point. Did you and Mike and BJ all do it uh, in a room? Because doing the session as a group is a highly uncommon thing, if people don't know, nowadays. So I bet you felt like you stepped back in time when all three of you were in a room doing the voiceover. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, remember, this was a commercial. It wasn't animated. It's true. Oh, you know, uh, people who do commercials work completely differently from people who do animation. So they may not have even realized, Oh, you mean we can do these people separately? Yeah. Right. Which we won't inform them because there's, no. you know, there's a great story. Michael Bell, you know, he, he told us a little bit about that session and he says, you know, I felt so bad because I had like one word and BJ had one word and yeah. Neil's got to read off, you know, three or four <laughs> sentences of coffee in this high pitch pitch voice. And, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's just really funny. Pitch voice was let's go Voltron force. And then Keith, uh, Keith more or less did the pitch. That's did the my... pitch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, from from the original show, the original Voltron show, we have many fans here that watch that are still watching that show. Um, can, is there any stories from that? I mean, I know that's a different recording experience with a different uh, voice director. Yeah, the Voltron was strange. It was like no other show I've ever done because what happened was the people who produced it bought these two existing Japanese shows. And they were going to revoice them. But then because of cultural differences and I don't know what, they realized that's not going to work. So they created original scripts and then they had to comb through the video they had to find scenes that would fit the story they'd written. It had to be like, you know, a multi-level uh, crossword puzzle or, or whatever, whatever those things are you put together. And, <laughs> and, and so essentially what, I never saw a frame of this stuff. None of us did. We just came in and there would be a script and to the right of each line would be a number like 5.6 and that would be 5.6 seconds. And that was, the, that was the amount of time that the character's mouth moved. So you had to get the line and you, you could be a, a tenth of a second on either side. So they would accept 5.5 uh, to 5.7. Anything above or below that, you got to do it again. So it was this huge, some of the longer lines were just crazy. It's like 21 seconds. All right. Well, that was 18 seconds. Can you slow it down a little? Oh, that was 24 seconds. Can you speed it up? Oh, that was uh, 19 seconds. Now you got to slow it down. <laughs> I'm trying to act here. <laughs> oh, my God. Acting to a stopwatch. You know? Speed it up. <laughs> Hey, Nuri, uh, I think we're getting close on time. Do you want to do some questions from the folks out there? Yeah, sure. Let's go to the beginning. Um, uh, I saw Chase, some good ones in there. 
Chase the, Collinsworth the like wants you to know that you're his favorite G.I. Joe actor. Oh, thank you, Chase. That's something we have in common. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to. Uh, okay, so Raymond Lister said, "What were his feelings about the 1987 Joe movie overall, and what was your, and your part in it?" Uh, as I recall, our old pal Shipwreck had a grand total of four lines, and <laughs> I I felt the same about the G.I. Joe movie as I did about the uh, Transformers because they did the same thing. They killed Duke in the middle of yeah. well, later it was revealed he's only in a coma. And he will come out of his coma when his toy starts selling again. <laughs> <laughs> Go buy a toy and he'll well, come out of his coma. <laughs> Trevor Bronson says, Mr. Neil Ross, good to see you and hear you uh, hear your voice again, sir. Um, hey, you. Trevor. Uh, will Santana says, Neil Ross has one of the most iconic lines in the animated Transformers movie. And uh, I think you, you know the line, right, Neil? Oh, yes, I know the line. Yeah. Okay. The, the, I like that the, the, uh, the movie premiered when that line hit, uh, the whole place erupted in cheers. You couldn't hear the next 30 seconds of dialogue because people were screaming. And I thought, oh, oh I'm on to something. So the famous line, I've got better things to do tonight than die. <laughs> Such a great line. Such a great line. Um, a question for Mr. Ross later on. I've had the pleasure of seeing you at events a number of times, one of which was to gift you a challenge coin from the Fighting 788th Costume Group. I was curious if we had inducted you into the group as an honor. I'm not sure, and usually I book Neil for all his events, and I'm not sure if he's been inducted I yet. I don't think so. Um, Morgan Lofting, beware Cobra Spies. <laughs> That's because Morgan was uh, Morgan actually is watching. She was on oh. watching. I don't know if she still is, but if you are Morgan, we love you. Um, you probably out an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, she was like, oh, those guys. <laughs> My, Michael Rester said, where can I buy a copy of your book? You can go to for more information, neilbook.com, but it's also available on Amazon, uh, iTunes, and Audible. So yep. But Neil Book, N E I L B O O K dot com, and uh, all the information is there. Uh, do, 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 I'm so okay. Uh, Michael Rezer is happy about the Roger C. Carmel story. <laughs> uh, Michael Rezer has a good question. Neil, thank you for all your stories. Do you have any stories of the late Stan Jones? Um, not really. I mostly worked with him on, uh, the OG Readmore show and he was a, a perfect gentleman and a wonderful actor, but, uh, you know, we just came in, did the job and shook hands and parted. I don't, I don't have any Stan Jones stories. I'm sorry. Chase Collinsworth said the parachutes would always open, which <laughs> is definitely something that was a good thing. Um, yep. I'm trying to see the truth. Uh, do you see any other questions I haven't put up, Chris? Because I only I'm limited on what I can see. Uh, is not all Are these the know. questions on, that I see on the right? Right. A piece of that I still cherish. Uh, no, I think the uh, Ryan Yost chimed in. Hi, Ryan. How you doing? <laughs> we always love when Ryan Yost Ryan, is around. Ryan says thanks for all you do, Neil. Uh, before we end the show off, Neil, are there any words of advice for your G.I. Joe or Transformer fans? Any, you know, parting words that you can leave them? Well, I guess all I can say is that it is so wonderful to be remembered for something. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting all choked up here. <clears throat> the um, Actually, I have a... Um... It's just wonderful to be remembered uh, because so much of what you do, it's almost instantly forgotten. And to have people be such wonderful, supportive fans of these two shows and my little part in them after all this time is just, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful to the fates for letting me par be part of the show for Wally Burr making it such a great show and for all the fans out there it's 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 wonderful thank you I, I i'm so glad you left us on that and uh morgan lofting bro where's your uh, parrot the baroness 
Uh, he's a, he's in a in a box in the back. <laughs> he's hiding, <laughs> eating his crackers. And, and Keone Young says, "Hey Neil, are you doing any recording from home nowadays?" That's the only way you can do it nowadays. Yes, a little bit, a little bit here with my humble uh, studio. We we want to thank you, Neil, for coming on i mean a lot of the fans are so grateful for you there's not a lot of interviews with you uh unless you're doing a convention so thank you so much for coming on today can you tell people where they can find you if you want to plug anything other than the book which is neilbook.com uh you can find neil on facebook and uh as he said earlier he adds people so um (laughs) he might not respond to you but he definitely will probably add you (laughs) well well, I, I, now that I have this opportunity, if you're going to message me, if you have a particularly insightful comment or a perceptive question, uh, great. But hi there, or <laughs> so-and-so is waving at you, is not probably going to get a response. Also, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'll save you the trouble. You don't need to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, before we end the show, uh uh, Chris wants to remind you of a few things. So, Chris, h- take it away. Thanks. <laughs> uh, there will be a new CelebRx Live weekly inside look into G.I. Joe. Uh, we will be streaming live every Thursday at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, unless we tell you otherwise. Our next guest for next Thursday will be somebody that Neil's very, very familiar with. Our good buddy, Mr. Michael Bell. Oh, Yay. <laughs> it's going to be an episode that you won't want to miss. You don't, yes. don't want to miss Michael Bell. And once again, I think it's time to take off. So I am Chris Arsaga, and you can follow me at The Real Arsaga. And remember, CelebWorks is where Gabriel Barbecue Kelly makes all our steaks medium well. And this has been Nary Lemus. You can follow me at the real Nary Lemus on Instagram. Just leaving you with a quick saying that means a universal hello, goodbye, thanks for stopping, and stay safe always. Yo, Joe. Yo, night Joe. Up. Night, everyone. Wait, we got to get Neil to do it in the shipwreck voice. Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe. Yes. <laughs> night, everybody. Night, everybody.